tundra in the west, conversations with Australian writers, although sometimes we have snuck in an American writer or two. And of course, you fill out those little forms and on them you say, who would you like to have? And we've brought her by popular acclaim, Kerry Greenwood. So all coming for the first time tonight. Could you please welcome to the stage, Michelle Fink and Kerry Greenwood. I made a round of applause, thank you. Kerry Greenwood. Well, let me introduce Kerry Greenwood. She is prolific and dedicated. A writer who seems to cross genres and, from my reading anyway, seems to relish challenge. Her inspiration comes from the past and the future. Her work is full of detail and is beautifully crafted. There's a shining intelligence and I think a real curiosity that I was fond of her. She has degrees in English and law from Melbourne University and is a practicing solicitor. Still, the legal aid duty solicitor at Sunshine Magistrates Court. Kerry, is that right? I stood, I did practicing so long, eventually I did <laughs> uh, There are books. She's written books. Let me uh, run through a few, shall I? Um, the Delphic series, Cassandra, Electra, Medea. <laughs> oh, let's skip that bit then, eh? <laughs> uh, for those who don't have a fantastic view of that, that is quite a gun. I'm going to ask about that gun. Um, 19, Franny Fisher Mysteries. Six in the Karina Chapman series. Stormbringer series and the predecessors for those books, The Broken Wheel, Cave Rats and Feral, short stories, plays, a swag of other novels that if you want to be specific, I'm sure Kerry will show you her back later. Um, recipes for crime collection, non-fiction work on murder and on murder too. She's edited a crime anthology. There is a list of awards here that are pretty staggering, including the Ned Kelly Award for Crime Writing, Australian Book Council of Australia, Book of the Year Award. She's a crime fiction writer here, and I suspect that many of you are here because of one character in particular, a sleuth who is whip smart, savvy, sassy, a seductress, a Florida tiger moth, a fiend behind the wheel of a Hispano disguiser, a woman of impeccable taste, remarkable wardrobe, with a taste for interesting men, exotic cocktails, danger, too many gaspers, possibly for her own good, but I somehow think it wouldn't have helped her in the yeah. end. Um, daring, charming, and with the, and I'm quoting a writer who just happens to be by my side, the sweetness of a chocolate-coated razor blade. That's true. <laughs> I speak, of course, of Franny Fisher. Kerry Greenwood was born in Footscray, lives in Footscray and is tonight joining us here in Footscray to talk about her life and more. Thank you, Kerry. <laughs> and for the like time. To welcome, Kerry. <laughs> oh, we might as well get, get it over with straight away. Oh. The top, the top, what's that? This it's magnificent. Is a silk coat made for me a very long time ago by my friend, Sue Conkin, and it has spaces on it for a large number of books. And every time I uh, have a new book published, I write the name on it. So I'm hoping to live long enough to cover the whole <laughs> thing. Um, I wanted to have more books than I have years. I'm 58 years old, I have 61 published works. So <coughs> I did it. <coughs> on the other hand, I'll never live long enough to write all the books that I want to write, however long I live. So I just like, it, like writing books. You I've can guess. <laughs> you, yeah. There is just a couple of clues mm. along the way. Mm. Um, if we can start our chat today, the fact that we have met, we were talking about this before, um, we've met in a non-professional sense, in, um, and I'll explain why. I have children at Footscray Primary School, oh, Geelong right, Road. Yes. Geelong Road State School rules. <laughs> and... Um, and 
when I, I was reading in one of the weekend papers a few years ago, and it was one of those stories about um, where people get their inspiration for writing or for, for being creative in the way that they do. And I recognised the school that my kids go to instantly from its beautiful photo. And in it, Terry spoke quite eloquently about an experience in her, her early school life about a teacher. I, I'd like you to tell that story in a minute. Um, but it had a real resonance for me because, you know, when we talk about our kids, which we do interminably, sorry, um, but one of the things that uh, moves me greatly is the thought that when our kids are at school that they may make the connection to the thing that, the, you know, their passion is one way of putting it or or their driving force. Um, you know, we put a lot of... Res teachers have a lot of responsibility and uncovering that is just another. But I wonder... I, I think that's what I found so moving about that story, Terry. Would you share that? Oh, of course, yeah. That was... Um, I am Pitsy was sitting there I am at Geelong Road State School, which is now called... Footscray Primary, Primary, Primary School. School. On Geelong Road, yes. Um, a very school. old Bluestone-type building. Um, the very first time I'm starting school, I am five and a half years old, because I was born in June, and all I can see are knees. I'm about this big, small, frail, wearing an incredibly terrible dress, because all I wore were hand-me-downs because my family was very poor. My dad was a wolf. And so I'm standing here feeling very unfashionable and very scared because the place is full of people who are bigger than me and, li and, and faster than I am. And a boy ran past me in that unflinching, terrible steel playground asphalt and tore his knee as he fell over. There was blood. I was about, I was holding onto my mother's hand. And then a lady going past bruised my nose, which was small, as was I, with her basket. And I wanted to go home really badly. <coughs> and then at the same level as me, unlike everything else in that crowd, the most beautiful pair of brown eyes. And there were no brown eyes in my family except my father. Uh, all the eyes I knew were pale. Um, she had black hair, uh, brown hair cut in a sort of basin cut. You know, when you pull off a basin and the cut child's head and cut around it. She was wearing a purple velveteen dress with orange skyrockets on it, even worse than mine. And she put out her hand and said, Harakalo, which is Greek for please. I'd never heard another language in my life. And I put out my hand and I said, please. And she was my best friend. She is still my best friend. Her name was Rachel Ojoiz. She's the natural of George Zakalopoulos. She was in third grade before she could spell it in English. And <laughs> but she was my best friend, which is why I speak primitive Greek, because she didn't speak English yet. She was clearly my best friend. But it was just unfortunate we couldn't communicate for a while. <laughs> but small children absorb languages like arborea rice absorbs stock. You just by absorption, it's just sponge, we're sponges. I inherited an incredibly good memory. Genetically, it's nothing I did. I just have it. So I learned to speak Greek and she learned to speak English and we were terribly happy together. Till we got to third grade, where they split us up. And so I wasn't with them anymore, so I was totally on my own. And they wouldn't believe I could read. And I learned to read when I was three, sitting in my mother's lap. I had a book that I always loved. Katie the Kitten, a small tiger cat, with a sink, with a head, on a ball, in a cat. I can still recite it. I can recite almost anything I've read. So I knew how to read because she turned the page every time she read it. Poor mother could read it. She was rather poor. So I knew what was on each page. So I learned to read like that by the absorption method. So by the time I got to third grade and was given yet another copy of something called Holidays, which was just up from John Can Run, Becky Can Run, I was, I was really getting to the state of complete despair. My best friend wasn't there anymore. She was being beaten in the next class for not understanding English, willfully not understanding English. And I was, I was really feeling despairing. So I th there was this new teacher. He was about 18 feet tall, mostly composed of lead. His name was Mr. Witherspoon. And um, I thought, okay. So I, anyway, I went, he was reading a newspaper. We were all doing stuff, holidays. And I went up to him and I sort of touched his sleeve and said, uh, I can actually read. And, so, and instead of going, telling me to go away, gave me his newspaper and said, read. So I read a lot of his newspaper, and he took it away just after I got to the crime news. <laughs> looked, quite, looked quite interesting. <laughs> and he gave me a key and said, there's the, there's the books. The books are all in that key. You can have as many as you like, one at a time. You have to put one back before you can take one out. And it was the best present that anyone ever gave me. Um, because I had 
I had everything. I had The Wind in the Willows. I had Alice in Wonderland. I had um, all of the famous five and the Secret Seven and the five, five fan what have I said? The five fine dancers. I had innumerable riches beyond any um, that I've ever, anyone has ever given me a present like that again. Um, I don't think anyone could give me a present like that again. Because not only did he believe me, but he gave me the key to the book cabinet. And after that, there was no stopping me. I read everything, bags of cornflake packets, Aspen packets. I even got neuralgia once because I had to read it in any cell, and Aspen packets. I read everything, and but he believed that I could read, and it was wonderful. I've never forgotten it. And I was on the radio a few years ago, uh, and someone said, what was the best present you ever got? And I said, uh, I told the story, and he rang up, he said he drove us past Strap off the South Eastern Freeway, and he rang up the uh, ABC, and I, so I got in contact with him again, so at least I got to tell him how much I really loved him. Um, and uh, he was, by the time they were dedicating a building to my family at, at that school, and he had, he had died, it was just sad, but his wife was there and his son was there. And his son really looked like him. He wasn't <laughs> quite 18 feet tall, but I'm a bit taller than I used to be. Um, yes, uh, that's a story that means a lot to me and I, I reckon you probably... Sometimes teachers are terribly, terribly important. And that was a terribly important thing. I could read whatever I liked at home, but at school, I was, I was sinking into despair. And if you think that a seven or eight-year-old eight year child can't sink into despair, then you've forgotten being seven. The dedication that you talk about, it's, it's strange that I should be here because it, it was my, actually my suggestion that it Thank you be called much. the Greenwood Building. I do appreciate it. Because of that story and because, um, and I know it's, it's a bit of a trite expression, but I, I do see you as a, a real local hero. And I want to ask you about your scriptural connection. Your I was born here. My grandfather was born here. My grandmother was born here. Most of us were born here. We all went to that school. I'm the oldest child. My, I had my sister Janet, my sister Amanda, my brother. We all went to that school. Then we all went to Marabone High School, which has now become a sports school. <laughs> I would have <laughs> hit it in there all right. <laughs> um, and uh, we've always belonged here. My grandfather, uh, Alfred Dudley Greenwood, was a real estate agent. His name is still on the, I think it's still on the thing. That was him. Yeah. But um, that was one side of the family. And the other side was my mother, Jeannie. Uh, her father came from the Isle of Mull. He was from Mackenzie. The other family, Mackenzie, his, um, and my grandmother was Welsh. So that covers everything, really. Yeah. I like it here. And I've travelled around, lived in lots of places, but I really like it here. It's always been so interesting. I had to got sent by a paper to stay in um, Camberwell for a week, and then we died of boredom. <laughs> Everyone well, happy no here? <laughs> sorry. There were no, I'd say that if you all came from Camberwell either, <laughs> there was no, one, no other voices. I, I like walking into a market and listening out and hearing, I mean, I can pick up Greek, I can usually identify most things. The only few times I ever got stuck with a language was when I was in the football, uh, in the market, and there were two traders talking to each other. I thought, I don't know that language. It's not, it sounds a bit like Arabic, but it's not Arabic. It's not any of the Arabic, not in, in what is it? So finally I went up and asked him to speak Hebrew. That's where I didn't recognize it. <laughs> After that I recognized Hebrew, <laughs> yeah. I like it here. This has always been an astoundingly comfortable mix of, uh, of, of different people from different places. We could not have a pogrom here. We couldn't have a race riot because you'd have to convince too, well, you know, pick a, pick a target. You'd have to convince far too many people who were, as it might be, I don't know, Lebanese Christians, that there was something viciously wrong with Russians. Uh, when actually they all know that it's viciously wrong with Lebanese Muslims, if you see what I mean. The, when I was at school, the Greeks, Turks, and Macedonians weren't allowed to sit next to each other. Now they're marrying each other because they're actually a lot closer together. What Footscray has a leavening effect on racial hatreds. All these kids during the um, late unpleasantness in the fall of Yugoslavia were saying that they were going to go off to, um, to fight for one side or another. But what they had were a lot of school kids saying, my dad's a bit funny actually, you know. <laughs> so he wasn't gonna tell his friends that his best friend Slavko was actually belonged to the other tribe. <laughs> We have a leaving effect. We have football effect. 
with I was born in the year that the last time <laughs> Australia won the premiership. Oh, that is the icing on the Footscray My father cake. said it was a good year for both regions, <laughs> yes. Your father was a Footscray supporter? Avidly. His <laughs> we, as a memorial to him, we bought him a seat in the, norm, in the gent stand in the, in just where he used to like to sit, a good view of the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to ha having games there again. I personally can't stand football. I have been spending my entire life gluing together the sad remains <laughs> of those who came back saying, umpires. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I th it is an incredibly important local thing, so therefore I support it. Well, it's nice to have you here. Thank you. Um, if we can talk about being a writer, the actual becoming a writer, I have a bit of a shtick I do in my non-fiction classes, which is about what you do if you get your free Vista print card that says that you're a writer and then you are and that the the drive then to be a writer and to compete and be competitive has to come from within. It does the label is easy to obtain, but it's the interior work that that comes. And I wonder about when you thought of yourself as a writer. I wouldn't put writer on my passport application until I had five books published. <laughs> but I was a storyteller from the time I was a very small child. Do you want to hear about that? That was fun. Do we have elder yes, sisters? <laughs> elder sisters? Yes, yes, only children. All right, all of us. So, um, Elder sisters have a funny tradition, in an uh, uncomfortable tradition in any family because uh, whatever they do that is wrong, they're required to stop their rotten siblings from doing evil things like feeding snails to the baby. Um, so I figured it was protein. I just talked it out his mouth, you know, um, or whatever. But you also, they are not going to pay. Your siblings are not going to pay attention to you like they do to your parent. So I was the eldest of four children. My father was a shift worker. My mother worked very hard to try and keep us all together and keep us all clothed and fed and everything. So we all had chores, and one of them was um, my sister Ma Amanda, for instance, had to do the washing up. She did it every year from the time she had to stand on a chair to reach the sink. Once she was uh, away from home and had her own money, she bought a dishwasher and she has never washed a dish <laughs> in her life since. Uh, but I was, my job was to get everybody uh, out of their clothes, into the bath, not allowing anyone to drown anyone else, however much it struck them as a good idea, um, dried, clean, into their jammies, into bed, and mop up the bathroom which I did every night of my life uh, until I was 19. So consequently, I had to tell the story that put everybody to bed. It was a ritual. A story must be told. And because my audience had a broad range in age, it was very difficult for me to tell a story that everybody, well, to read a story that everybody wanted. If the story amused my sister Janet, who's only two years younger than me, it would not amuse my little brother, who was also louder and stroppier and the only boy. So after the hop on pulp incident, when the book got thrown out the window, <laughs> <coughs> and I was ritually cursing the innocent name of Dr. Seuss, I thought, all right, I'll tell a story. What's the simplest form of story? It's a fairy tale. How does a fairy tale start? Once upon a time. And how does it finish? And in between, you can say anything you like. <laughs> so if you're telling stories to children, I, I recommend this, especially if there are power failures or something. Storytelling is very good for gluing the family together. You pick the stroppiest of the siblings, the one who's going to give you the most trouble, or the one who really wants to go away and play war games, and you say, you're the hero, and you're going to pick a, a fairy tale thing. Rescue the captive princess from the tower, fight the dragon, all that stuff. Of course, in my case, most of my audience was female, so I had the princess in stainless steel armor mounting her white mare in order to go and rescue the captive prince from the tower. And when we were fighting the dragon, I didn't want to actually go around killing dragons. So we um, learned how to speak dragon with the intervention of a friendly witch and a talking salmon. And we, s we went into an agreement with the, the, the uh, dragon to have a castle heating business. <laughs> Worked beautifully. <laughs> and anyway, so I told these stories every night. I told long stories because it's much harder, as anyone who writes fiction will know, to start again with a new group of people every night. And I wanted to go and do other things. I wasn't really wrapped in it. I was just doing it because I had to. And otherwise, there'd be rebellion. And my mother would tell me that I had to keep talking and I wanted to go back and read my book. So I put into those fairy tales everything I'd been reading. 
chunks of Greek mythology. One of my favorite characters, the flying horse, met Pegasus. Because I learned Greek from Kemi, I also learned um, Greek legends and Greek, uh, and the fact that there's a lot of Greek in English. When I went to high school and met Italian kids, there's an awful lot of Latin in English too. So, but in, when I was six, they were cooking up zoa, which is animal, is zoology in English, zoological gardens, for instance. And um, all those, I was getting an amazing kick out of languages. I used to die of super cheese. Um, it was a wonderful thing, and it's hilarious. I love, I love work. So I told stories, and I didn't know that they actually liked them until at a Christmas party recently. They lined up all their children and sat them all down, and these are intimate children, and said, Auntie Kerry's going to tell you the story <laughs> about the dragon. Auntie Kerry thought, oh, dear. <laughs> I don't remember the story about the dragon. Never mind. We'll come up with one. think of yourself as a writer you may not have had the courage to say no no I didn't like think that. of any courage it's just I didn't think of myself as being particularly important I think writers are important people I never met any writers until I was on the Indian writers train uh, and that was murder on the Ballarat train that was 1993 <coughs> I just thought of myself as a storyteller and I was doing it for fun I never expected to particularly get published I was writing novels because they they took me somewhere else. That's why I used to write about the present or the past. I never wrote about the present. I wrote about the past or I wrote about the future. Uh, my father adored science fiction. So he gave me science fiction books. Actually, his favorite author was Ray Bradbury, who writes the short stories, God keep them, uh, which I read since I was eight. The first one I read was called A Sound of Thunder. It scared the hell out of me. It's about time travel and uh, going back to hunt uh, a dinosaur. Uh, you remember? Do you remember the story? Yeah, he steps on a butterfly, yeah. yeah. When he comes back, the future will likely change. Yeah. Um, anyway, so my, fa my father adored science fiction. My mother, on the other hand, loved history. So I just read everything. And both my grandparents had totally different tastes. And I just read everything. Um, I read three volume novels by Mrs. Florence Barclay called The Rosary, which I don't recommend. <laughs> And, you know, everything that was around. So I never thought of myself as a writer. I just wrote a lot. I wrote the first sentence I wrote down was called The World is Round and Things in Space, which I thought was deeply significant. And um, I realized that someone could read that and know that incredibly important fact without me being there. It was the, there's a Kipling story called How the Alphabet Was Made, which is in the Just So stories, which I absolutely recommend for that feeling. I know um, one of the interviews that with you that I did read, it was one of those questions, what's your proudest moment? And the, the answer was when I, well, one of my proudest moments was when I held my first book in my hand. Mm -hmm. I slept with it under my pillow for a week in case I imagined it. That's right. a beautiful idea. Yeah. I kept slipping my hand under my pillow to see if that book was still there. Well, my first published book was Cocaine Blues, um, and that was 1988 I wrote that. Uh, I was anxious. I was just, I just wrote books for fun. So I wrote lots of books when I was, I had to get into law to do, to come and, I mean, I was, I was um, horrified when I was 14 that three of my classmates went to jail or went to juvenile detention because their fathers couldn't, none of their families could afford a lawyer. So I decided at that point that I just had to do it for them. So that's a very good Year, um, age to mount your white horse now mm -hmm. and <laughs> so I did and that meant I had to get into law which meant I had to work very hard because I was doing it from Melbourne High School which wasn't as easy as it looked and um, then uh, so I did that I got into university I was very fortunate because my teachers went on strike for three months of my final year so instead of reading the bit of Chaucer I was supposed to be reading I read all of Chaucer <laughs> And recite, I could recite most of it. And I actually did a third year English paper on the Chaucer I read. And we did, I did all my art subjects. I did very well in all of my art subjects because I didn't have to go to school. Um, and I got into university I, um, and I was doing various art subjects as well to stop myself from dying of boredom doing law. Um, a lot of it, some of it's really interesting. The rest of it could put paint to sleep whole freestanding bodies of water would be slumbering. Um, and uh, I did, I wrote books for fun and I wrote lots of books. I did some research and history research at university about, um, and in 
40, the 1740 in England in St Albans, and wrote eight novels about the home and our friend and the record. I just like writing books. So th those novels are unpublished? Or yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. They're not terribly good. I was learning how to write a book. Learning to write a novel is a physical skill, like learning to swim, learning to make love, learning to ride a bicycle. Um, you have to learn how you do it. It's nobody does it the same, fortunately. Nobody <laughs> does it the same. Anyway, everybody does this sort of thing differently. And it's a big, it's a physical weight. Um, Darcy Nyland said, I've just finished a novel and I feel like some kind of stranger is removed, just like a rock solid at the moment. And that's a bit what it feels like. Even however fast you write, and I write very fast, it's still, uh, it's exhausting, it's tiring. And it's, it's the sort of, of, of um, circus trick Whereas if you're juggling a chainsaw, an orange, a bowling ball, a ferret, mm -hmm. and you do it really well, if it works, it's gorgeous. If it doesn't work, it's really loud and messy. So it requires learning how to do it. It's just like, um, like any other physical skill. It's much more like a physical skill than um, other sorts of writing. You can learn um, all sorts of tricks. You can learn point of view, you can learn um, uh, different speeches, different writing, different voices, all that sort of stuff. But what you've really got to write is a story that wants to be written. It's sitting there going, poke up. You know, other people have a muse, a beautiful winged woman who descends in fire, probably called a rato, uh, and uh, wraps her wings around her supple. I have a very old lady with a puny little bun with pins in it, who pokes me in the middle of the back with a specially sharpened forefinger at three o'clock in the morning and says, get up, lazy thing, write down that book, do it now. So I get up and write it down. <laughs>